when I started. Yeah. Okay. There we go. <laughs> yes. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. And um, I'll, I'll <laughs> people are beginning to roll in. This is a very exciting uh, MNR this week. Uh, Wednesdays is MNR day from October to June. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar. And, it gives me absolutely great pleasure that uh, we're going to get Paolo Della Sana on uh, chat, G GPT. Uh, but before I introduce uh, Paolo, and as people are rolling in, just a, a quick mention, for those of you who are not familiar with um, MNRs, you can go on the MTNet uh, webpage and you'll find a link to the MNRs. And these MNRs are every Wednesday, um, uh, from October to June. And there you'll see registration links for new MNRs and um, uh, YouTube videos, links to YouTube videos and uh, presentations of past MNRs. So we have three more coming up this month. Uh, next week, we have Anna Platz, who's talking about Western Bohemia. Uh, the week after, we have Bruce McManus, who's talking about UTEM, which is the University of Toronto Electromagnetic System. Uh, and this is actually a homage to uh, Yves Lamontang, who uh, died fairly recently. And the week after, we have Graham Hill talking about the work of uh, Phil Wanamaker, who was uh, well known in the MT world and who also passed away a few months ago. Uh, but today, again, great pleasure to, to have Paolo speak to us today on testing chat, chat GPT-3 for the geosciences, benefits and limitations. And Paolo will give us his experience over the last months in, in playing around with this fantastic new tool. Uh, Paolo graduated from geology and uh, physics. You'll all have read this as you, uh, as you registered, so I won't spend time. He's a, a, a senior geophysicist and a project manager in any SPA, expert in integrated geophysical methods. Author of several patents, published more than 100 papers, five books. He received any award as best technological innovation of the year. So I'll stop there, Paolo, because I'm sure everyone wants to listen to you and not me. <laughs> and I'll, <laughs> I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much for your introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, really happy to to share my experience in testing uh, GPT-3 with, uh, with everybody. And I prepared some slides, so let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. Let me know if you see it. Yes, it's looking fine, but it's not in presenter mode yet. Okay, now, now it's great. Yep, yeah, perfect. Uh, okay, good. So as you can see from the subtitle, uh, I would like to uh, discuss with you about the benefits <clears throat> and uh, limitations of these two uh, for applications in uh, geosciences, but also in, uh, other, uh, in other areas. So uh, I also wrote a sort of white paper uh, that can be useful for everybody because I uploaded it on my research gate uh, page so you can download it if you like uh, and in that paper you can find a lot of uh, examples codes python codes that i prepared with support of gpt3 uh, and, and i hope that it can be useful as a complementary document of this presentation okay this is the outline of my talk I will give you a brief introduction, uh, remarking the basic aspects uh, of uh, GPT-3 and uh, the technology that is in the ground. I, I don't want to, to talk about uh, mathematical and uh, uh, IT aspects of uh, GPT-3 because you can find a lot of materials on, on internet. And I will give you also some useful reference at the end of the presentation. I prefer to talk about my personal experience, showing you a lot of examples uh, with the applications in geosciences and uh, in other fields. 
And also we like to start critical discussions about uh, benefits and limitations of this tool. And uh, also we like to show you sort of creative use of GPT-3 for developing new ideas and uh, new uh, technologies. Uh, so GPT-3, uh, GPT means generative pre-trained transformer. And uh, it means that it is a, a language generation model that is based on transformer architecture. Uh, what is transformer architecture? It is a sort of uh, a particular type of deep neural network that has been set uh, for natural language processing. And uh, this is uh, the main author, Aswani, uh, that uh, br brought a very interesting paper. Uh, I, I will give you the complete reference at the end of the presentation. Uh, the main uh, concept uh, of this transformer architecture is a, a self-attention mechanism. This is a particular type of uh, algorithm, let's say a sort of algorithm that, that uh, allows the deep learning model to analyze various parts of the input sequence uh, in order to understand what are the, the reciprocal dependencies between each specific part of the sequence that we give an input and the rest of uh, uh, the input. For instance, if we give an input a sequence of words, uh, this self-attention mechanism allows to uh, understand and to quantify the, the links and the relationships between each word with the rest, with the remaining part of the, of the sentence. So um, this is a very important uh, approach because uh, it allows to calculate from a quantitative point of view uh, a very useful representation of a sequence of any sequence of vector. Words in a sentence are just an example. We can input any type of, uh, of data, including geophysical data, of course, such as uh, time-lapse uh, geophysical measurements, for instance. And uh, these uh, metrics of attention weights is able to capture the links between each part of the data set with the remaining part of the, of the data set. So this is a, a very interesting mechanism, uh, very effective for understanding um, the relationship of each part of the data with the context. And this is the reason why it is very useful when we use it for natural language processing because it allows to capture the context of the sentence. And in some way, it is able to extract, at least partially, the meaning, the significance of each word in the context uh, of the sentence. So not only we have the information related with each word, but we have also the significance, uh, the semantic content of each word in its context. This is the strength of this approach. Another strength is that, that uh, transformer technology is a very powerful architecture, deep learning architecture to capture long range dependencies uh, in every type of input sequence because it considers all the elements simultaneously rather than one at a time. For instance, in uh, recurrent, uh, recurrent neural networks, uh, also, we can uh, capture uh, uh, the dependencies between the terms of the time series, for instance, or uh, any sequence, but uh, the one at a time. Instead, when we use uh, transformer architecture, we are able to capture uh, the long range dependencies uh, of all elements jointly. This is very, very important. So what we can do with the GPT-3? Uh, we can uh, produce text, can do language translation, text uh, summarization, question answering, and so on. And also we can do text to code generation. And this is very, very useful for, for scientists, not only for geoscientists. 
so let me do some examples, uh, showing you some uh, demonstrative tutorial in order to understand uh, what GPT-3 can do for, for us. Uh, for example, I start with this very simple demonstration. Uh, I asked the uh, chat GPT-3 to, to write code for me, a Python code for creating uh, fractals, Mandelbrot fractals. And so um, I um, prepared this short demonstration here. Let me run it. So basically I'm asking uh, GPT uh, to, to write, to generate a, a, a Python code for creating a Mandelbrot fractals and to plot uh, the, the final result in terms of a JPEG figure. So this is my request. I just send the request to, to GPT-3 and uh, it starts coding, explaining what it is doing. So in this case, it, it is coding in Python and uh, it also explains uh, the basic of, uh, of the code lines. And we, if, if we like, we can also increase the amount of explanations and comments. And uh, uh, it is just creating a, a routine, a script for applying Mandelbrot formula and for, plot, for plotting the final results in terms of a Mandelbrot fractal with the particular size. We also can change the parameters of our final results. And then we have just to copy uh, the code and pass it in our uh, Python development environment. This is a Jupyter notebook and we run it and we have the final result in real time. So this is just an example uh, showing you how we can use uh, GPT for supporting us in our coding activity. Of course, sometimes uh, the code works properly at the beginning, uh, sometimes it doesn't work. So uh, sometimes we need to update, uh, upgrade the code by ourselves. So it is strongly recommended to use GPT uh, for this purpose, for this coding purposes. If you have some knowledge about the code that you are using, about the language that you are using, because sometimes you need to update the code itself because uh, especially when the code is very complex, it doesn't work as, since the beginning and you need to, to uh, edit in some way uh, the results. But it should be clear that this opens new opportunities for creativity and for innovation, because uh, uh, you can understand that GPT-3 uh, can work as a very effective virtual assistant for us, for transforming uh, our ideas into prototype tools, uh, prototype codes, and for testing these codes. And I have used it over the past three months for creating and uh, developing many algorithms and codes in terms of processing, inversion, optimization, deep neural networks for image classification, image recognition, advanced statistics, sound analysis, and so on. And uh, let me show you some examples. Let's start uh, from some preliminary application that I have done. For instance, we know that global optimization is extremely important for geoscientists. So finding the global uh, minimum of uh, a complex function is extremely important for inversion, for uh, optimization in general. And uh, um, I wrote uh, many, many scripts with the support of GPT-3. Of course, I had to up, uh, upgrade and to edit these codes, but uh, uh, at least GPT-3 gave, gave me building blocks of the codes that was absolutely a good starting point for my coding activity. Also, I wrote novel algorithms for joint inversion of seismic and DM data, or new methods for uh, uh, predictive uh, prescriptive reservoir management, also for fluid displacement prediction, 
uh, of oil, gas, and CO2 in uh, uh, sandstones, uh, reservoirs, or in aquifers. And uh, in that case, I used the recurrent neural network and the transformers. Uh, I'll show you some examples later on. And also, I, I wrote many codes of time lapse resistive inversion for aquifer monitoring. This is just the, the first very simple case where I used the GPT-3 for uh, giving me the, the main building blocks for a, a code uh, for finding the global minimum of complicate function. Uh, all, all these codes are included in my reference uh, white paper that I uploaded on my research gate page. So you can, uh, you can check by yourself in details if you like. And of course, we are interested in applications in geosciences. And uh, in this case, we can understand the strength of uh, the transformers technology that is in the ground of GPT-3, because uh, transformers, uh, this particular type of deep neural network architecture um, have been created uh, uh, especially for uh, predicting future uh, data in a sequence that we give an input and for, for processing sequential data. And so this type of architecture is extremely useful for geoscientists that often record uh, monitoring geophysical surveys. For instance, sometimes we record uh, multiple geoelectrical surveys for uh, monitoring resistivity variations associated with the fluid displacement. In that case, we have a big, uh, historical data set that can be used by transformer architecture for predicting from a probabilistic point of view, the future uh, displacement of fluids. Um, and transformers are extremely powerful for that. In this case, I compare it ex exactly for that purpose, uh, the results of uh, uh, a recurrent neural network. Uh, so in, in this case, uh, GPT-3 uh, helped me to write this code where I use a long short time memory uh, recurrent neural network uh, for, uh, for predicting the resistivity of future uh, variations associated with fluid uh, displacement between two vertical wells. Uh, we equipped these wells with uh, electrical sensors in order to retrieve multiple resistivity models over time. And using this historical resistivity data set, LSTM can predict future uh, uh, variations of resistivity model in, for several steps ahead. And uh, these are associated with predicted fluids displacement in future. And I did the same also using transformers. Uh, here, the red arrows are indicating uh, the part of the code where we uh, import uh, in this case, a GPT-2 transformer, and uh, where we uh, create the model and uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, utilization of GPT, of uh, let's say of transformers, it's more correct to say transformers, is extremely uh, useful for geoscientists. But okay, this is a more familiar application of GPT-3, so I, I asked GPT-3 to support me in coding uh, a refraction tomography uh, uh, inversion code. Um, and in, in this case, you are the main building blocks of this, of this code. And this is a special code because it is a new methodology that I have just recently published uh, because here we have inversion supported by reinforcement learning, in particular by Q learning. So basically with this approach, I, I try to teach an artificial agent to explore the model space in the optimal way to find the absolute uh, minimum of a cost function in order to find the most robust velocity model starting from a refraction, uh, seismic refraction travel times. And in this case, uh, GPT-3 was very useful for me for me because it helped me, uh, me supported me in coding activity for improving the effectiveness of my methodology. 
Of course, many uh, is better than one. Many, many, uh, many um, transformers working together are much better than using just one. In fact, we can combine multiple transformers. Uh, in, in this code, uh, we have the building blocks where we can combine two transformer models, in, in particular GPT2 and the BERT, uh, the, 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 uh, which are two different uh, uh, deep learning methods based on transformer architecture. And uh, we can create a, a sort of parallel um, application of two or more transformers working together for producing more robust results. Let me do some uh, critical discussion about not only the benefits, uh, but also about the limitations of uh, GPT-3. Because sometimes not everything works properly, uh, especially when we try to create complex codes, we can ask GPT-3 to prepare just the building blocks uh, of a Python code or of a C++ code, and then we have to develop better or where to edit it in some way um, by ourselves. Uh, so uh, it's very important to say that uh, uh, there is a sort of first principle of uh, the chatbot, that is uh, the quality of the answers uh, is directly proportional to the quality of the questions. So if we ask ill-posed questions to the chatbot, of course, we will get bad and uh, useless answers. Uh, so a good question is, so what are the building blocks of the Python code for developing, uh, uh, for instance, joint inversion algorithm? This is a good question. Uh, then the question can be uh, improved if we um, specify to the code what types of library we decide we want to use, what kind of approach we want to use for combining, for instance, seismic and uh, electromagnetic data and so on. So uh, if we have very clear ideas in mind uh, about what we want to do, then we can get very useful answers from the chatbot. Instead, if uh, we don't have any good idea in mind, of course, we, we fall in the uh, so-called human machine life zone. So this is an obvious derivation. The effectiveness of the chatbot depends on uh, the skills of the user. Uh, I would say exponentially uh, on the skills of the user. Uh, so if uh, we have very good skills, uh, we can get a lot of um, support for uh, this technology. And otherwise we uh, fall in a sort of naive zone where we ask useless questions, uh, obtaining useless answers. So what is important is uh, to, uh, um, to improve the cooperation between artificial and biological intelligence. We are not in competition with uh, GPT-3. Many people uh, think that uh, we are in competition uh, with these artificial intelligence tools. Uh, I think this is uh, an ill-posed problem. We can cooperate a lot with these tools for improving uh, our results. So the key word is cooperation, not competition. Let me uh, do a, a step back, uh, coming back to applications in geosciences, um, because we can improve a lot uh, this type of cooperation with the chatbot when we link it with uh, existing uh, uh, libraries that we have on the uh, in internet. There are many, many interesting uh, geophysical uh, libraries, for instance, Pi, Gimli uh, uh, library is very useful uh, because it includes a lot of uh, useful scripts in Python for geophysical inversion modeling. And we can use GPT for uh, combining all these libraries uh, that we need for uh, different purposes in the same script, optimizing the uh, utilization 
of the libraries um, itself. And we can test uh, and test and test uh, until we get useful results. And for instance, I, I asked uh, GPT to, to help me uh, in, um, in writing a code uh, or joint inversion of refraction, seismic, and geological data. And this uh, Python library uh, has a lot of libraries, uh, sub libraries for doing that. So uh, um, GPT was very useful for building, uh, uh, for building the main blocks of this code and that you can see on the right of the screen. And, and starting from these building blocks, I developed a very interesting joint inversion algorithms for um, optimizing the, the integration of seismic and uh, geological data. Of course, we can do many additional applications, I did. And uh, for instance, this is very interesting for geologists. I, I wrote uh, um, a lot of codes in Python for uh, rock sample classification using machine learning based on uh, chemical composition. Basically, I use uh, chemical composition as attributes for uh, performing a supervised classification of rock samples. Uh, and um, GPT-3 was very useful for supporting me in, in, in the coding activity again. Or also was useful for helping me in writing codes for uh, image recognition uh, uh, of uh, thin sections, mineral thin sections for automatic classification of, of minerals and rocks. We can go also uh, outside the, the field of geoscience. We can use GPT also for other purposes. Uh, for instance, uh, I have a great passion for medical sciences and for medical diagnosis and uh, GPT-3 can help us in, in doing that. This is just an example where we have uh, uh, a medical diagnosis based on uh, uh, several uh, uh, medical attributes that here I have represented in uh, uh, two-dimensional display using principal component analysis. And in this case also, uh, GPT can be very useful for supporting your my, my code uh, coding activity. We can do also more creative use of GPT-3 uh, because GPT-3 can be as extremely useful for uh, helping us in uh, developing hybrid technologies and for linking the different scientific domains. I have used it uh, recently. Uh, for instance, I have already developed over the past years a, a, a new hybrid approach for um, extracting sounds from seismic data. Uh, you know that uh, the physics of the sound is not too different from the physics of the seismology. And so we can transform a segway format of seismic data into musical format um, using uh, particular algorithms such as uh, fast Fourier transform or stock wave transform, wavelet transforms. We can create spectrograms and from those spectrograms, we can extract uh, musical attributes that can be used for extracting the sounds from the seismic data. In such a way you can, uh, you can at the same time, you can see the seismic data and you can listen to the seismic uh, data. And CHAP uh, GPT-3 was very useful for uh, improving this approach that I have developed uh, and because uh, it was extremely useful for combining many uh, sound engineering libraries. In this case, I'm using Librosa uh, sound engineering and musical libraries that are Python libraries. They um, can be combined in a sort of smart way with the support of GPT uh for uh, improving my approach of uh, double uh, dual, dual sense interpretation of seismic data using images and sounds at the same time so this is a very creative way to use gpt 
combining the libraries that we like. Let me conclude with this uh, final example. Uh, that is a, a, another interesting uh, utilization of GPT. Uh, I have a big uh, library with real books in my home. And uh, my dream is to, to link the semantic content of all these books so that I can have in, in almost real time in front of me all the connections, the possible semantic uh, connections between several of these books, uh, philosophy books uh, or um, machine learning books, uh, mathematical books, physics, uh, artificial intelligence books, and so on. There are many semantic uh, connections between these books. And for a human, it is very difficult to capture all these semantic connections. Instead, for a machine, it is extremely useful. And so basically I used uh, GPT-3 for asking it to connect all the books that I have also uh, in electronic format or that can be easily found on internet in electronic format. So for GPT-3, it is extremely useful to explore the content of the books and to connect the books uh, in order to find, uh, let's say, innovative links or original connections between their content. And we can expand uh, this approach uh, uh, to scientific papers, uh, patents, applications, inventions, and so on. So basically we can ask GPT-3 to explore a large uh, corpus of uh, textual information in electronic format. The only requirement is that this corpus of uh, document must be in the knowledge base of GPT. And then you can explore these, uh, let's say, uh, 100 scientific papers about joint inversion, for instance, and patents about joint inversion and book about uh, joint inversion, and you can try to uh, um, combine in a sort of uh, combinatorial, combinatorial creativity exercise all this semantic information in order to derive new ideas to trigger new intuitions, new concepts, new inventions. Of course, not everything will be useful. Uh, I experimented that uh, about 70% uh, of the connections are trivial or are useless, but at least 20, 30% of the connections done by GPT-3 can be extremely useful and can be developed for developing new methods and new technologies, new patents, new ideas, new inventions. And this is exactly what I'm doing. So, this was my last slides. Uh, basically, I don't have any final conclusion because uh, the uh, exploration uh, work of this new tool is still in progress, at least for me. And uh, so we have more questions that, than answers, but uh, also some interesting answer. So the, the very important question is where are we going? Will artificial intelligence replace humans? And I think this is an ill-posed question. The well-posed question is, um, has a new form of cooperation opened up between artificial and uh, human intelligence? This is a very interesting question. Has the era of artificial creativity begun? So now we are going towards artificial creativity. Um, and this is a very, very interesting subject to discuss. And so this was my final slide. Uh, slide. Uh, these are some suggested readings. Probably the most important one is the first one. Attention is all you need. This is a, a, a very important scientific paper uh, published a few years ago about uh, the, the architecture of uh, transformers. So this type of deep neural network that works in background of GPT. 
And there are other papers uh, that uh, you can read if you are interested in understanding the details of this technology. So I really thank you for your attention and uh, I will be pleased to answer your questions, your comments. Thank you very much. Well, absolutely wonderful, Paolo. I, that was, uh, yeah, I mean, it just shows the very beginning of where we're going to go. And it's, uh, in one sense, it's very exciting, but in another sense, it's a little scary that, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we might, we might become redundant. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, I'll just read out a comment that uh, Skylar mm. Sorsby wrote in the chat, um, mm. because I think, I think it encapsulates my feeling as well. This is a fantastic mm. presentation, one of the most compelling I've seen on the use of uh, GPT-3. Thanks. I really appreciate the acknowledgements and tools on GPT-3 as a large language model rather than magic. Uh, and yeah. that the questions Paolo asks are targeted towards leveraging semantics, mm -hmm. i.e. what the LLM is good at, uh, to find uh, novel outputs rather than in ill posed questions asking mm -hmm. for meaning. I also appreciate the context that Paolo uh, places on the technology. It won't replace humans and certainly needs to be handled carefully to get usable outputs. Well, thank you, Skylar. Absolutely apropos uh, comment. And yeah, that absolutely, absolutely agree. Yeah, the, the, the key point is that uh, I don't think that uh, GPT will replace experts, but will support experts. Uh, a philosophical question. Can, do you think chat GPT can create new knowledge or is it uh, efficiently linking existing knowledge? I think that uh, the two things are uh, connected because uh, sometimes a, a good approach for creating the new ideas and new knowledge is by combining the old knowledge. Many, many new things, many new technologies uh, derive from a creative combination of pre-existing technologies. So uh, GPT can be a strong support for creating the new knowledge in the sense that this can help us in connecting and integrating all the new, all the, all the uh, information. Uh, for, for instance, uh, geophysicists uh, very well know uh, that uh, when we combine different types of uh, geophysical data, such as seismic and EM, we can get something new from pre-existing data. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so this is my, my, my point of view. Something new can be derived from yeah. old things uh, through yeah. Yeah. innovative combinations. Although, yeah, but, well, yes. sorry, Max. Yeah, if I may, um, to me that raises a, a bit the question, what does it mean, knowledge? Does it need <laughs> to involve a human? Yes, because for me, knowledge is like, there is a person who has an understanding, yes? And uh, if you, because otherwise you might say maybe ChatGPT already knows everything because implicitly somewhere in the system, yes, uh, all these connections are already made. So that's, I mean, that's probably too far for this discussion. I just find it an interesting oh, this, this uh, sort point. of philosophical aspect of the whole thing then, yes? Now, this is a very important philosophical, but also pragmatical aspect. So the, quest, the, the key question, what is knowledge? It's a very important question. Uh, I think that knowledge is, let's say the, the concept of knowledge is strictly linked with the concept of significance, of semantic. So when we are able in some way to capture the semantic content of our data, of our information, we get some knowledge, some type of knowledge. Otherwise, we have just data, just information. And there is a big difference between information and, right. the, signi right. and the significance that right. we give to information. And this type of semantic content uh, can be derived just partially by understanding the context of our data in the remaining part of the uh, data set. So if we understand the context of, uh, for instance, of uh, a rock sample in the geological area, 
we understand the significance of that rock sample much better. And so we have knowledge, not only yeah. information yeah. about that sample. So, so this is yeah. this is something that GPT can help uh, yeah. to do because yeah. it is able to capture partially the context of uh, of the data. Yeah, my my view on this is rather simplistic. I think we go from data to information to knowledge mm. to understanding to wisdom. And uh, ChatGPT, to my mind, is working in the middle here. It will not create new data. We have to still collect new data. Uh, yes. Yeah. Of course, GPT yeah. uh, can, of course, can help you in uh, uh, improving your knowledge about new data. And so, in that sense, it, it can be a strong support for us. Oh, we, we have a, a question from uh, Andre Kuchman. Um, okay. What is the learning time it takes if you have a data set where you don't have any knowledge mm. about, so no input data set? Could you use it to train GPT? GPT is uh, basically um, based on uh, uh, deep neural network architecture. So we have many hidden layers working uh, in background from uh, between the input layer and the output layer. So the, the uh, computation time of a GPT, of a, any type of a transformer architecture, is basically equivalent to the computation time of a, a, a very deep neural network. And uh, uh, it depends on uh, the data that you are Processing. For instance, just to give you an example, uh, recently I have classified uh, about uh, 10,000 uh, chemical composition of, uh, of uh, rocks uh, using a transformer. So using this type of deep neural network. And uh, uh, of course, if we assume that we have a good training uh, in background, so a good training data set, then the classification performed by the transformer is extremely fast, a few seconds. Mm. So we are in the order of few seconds. Of course, the most demanding part in terms of computation times is the part of the training. So right. we, need to, we need to create a, a, a useful training data sets. And this, then, this must be done by, by human. And uh, it takes time, of course. But the classification part, of a transformer is very, very fast. Yeah. Um, do we have any other questions from uh, the listeners? If anyone wishes to speak, please just raise your hand and uh, I'll make you, um, make you audible oh, and, and you can put your video on if you like. Yeah, there are. Max, yeah. Yeah, so there are a few things in the, in the chat, but maybe please, if you have a question, sort of, put it in the Q&A instead of the chat. And mm -hmm. in the meantime, maybe I would like to ask a more sort of concrete question, like tech, not technical mm -hmm. question, but experience question mm -hmm. about what you showed. So you showed these examples and you said, you know, okay, here chat GPT helped me to yes, develop this building block. Yes, and I knew maybe a little bit about, about it, but I didn't know, for example, how this library works in detail. So, you know, I asked ChatGPT. That's how I understood it. Yes, ChatGPT to write a bit of code and then I refined it. How is that difference in your different in your experience for to going to something like Stack Overflow or like a like a website where you know many people now would say, okay, I type this into Google, I find um, an, a code example and then adapt it mm. to my needs. There is a big difference. Uh, I have done a lot of, uh, let's say, editing of pre-existing Python codes that I found on, on internet before using the GPT in order to develop, uh, let's say, new approaches for inversion, uh, starting from the work that other people have done before, before my work. And it was a useful approach, of course, very pragmatic approach. But um, after the advent of uh, GPT, my, my development work was absolutely facilitated because uh, there is a big difference. Uh, I can ask GPT 
to develop exactly what I want. So if I have a very good idea, very, very clear ideas in my mind. So yeah, if, I, if I have a sort of, uh, let's say, uh, prototypal code, uh, a workflow, very detailed workflow in front of me, I can transform that workflow in a very detailed code with the support of GPT. And that code will do exactly what I want to do. And this is much more useful than uh, improving or changing or editing the code did by other people. I think there is a, a big difference. Okay, I suppose it's like if somebody else didn't ask exactly the same question that you have and it was answered sort of in the way that it's useful for you, you have a more transformative step to make it useful for you as to JetGPT, yeah. you can say, oh, actually, I want it like, yeah. like this. So, but to me, that sounds a bit like programming, but programming mm -hmm. with a natural language. I mean, does mm -hmm. that analogy fit in some way? Yeah, that, that's true. So you 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 basically you do a statement using a natural language, and you transform and GPT transform that natural language sentence into a code line or in several li uh, lines. That's true what you say. Um, but of course, if you have good skills in uh, coding, for instance, in C plus plus or in Python, uh, you can get more benefits from that because uh, you can edit, you can adjust the codes produced by GPT as you like. And you can um, debug the code uh, as you like, you can modify the code and you can improve it. So yes, of course, it is a sort of a natural language programming, you're right. But again, I don't think that this will exclude the skills of the human. Programmer. Yeah, and it's a bit like what we talked about um, <laughs> before. Yes, you need the skill at least to test that output yeah. and run it at, and then make modifications. Exactly. Yeah. There's a there's a comment in the in the chat, and, and please everybody send your messages in the QA so we don't miss them. But a comment can can chat GPT discover the theory of relativity, if it is only trained with a knowledge of physics in the 19th century? And I guess, <laughs> I guess the answer is no, because you, you wouldn't know. Well, first of all, you wouldn't have the data for See, relativity, and, and you, would, you wouldn't know to pose the sensible question. This is a very, very interesting question. Of course, I don't have the answer, to be honest, but I can, I, can, I can try to reply with my experience. Let me say that uh, a few days ago, I, I did a test with the GPT. I have in mind, since uh, many years, a general theory of integration of information, because I want to find the general criteria for integrating any type of information, ontology of physical information. Uh, and so my question is uh, if there is any general method for combining information in a constructive way to generate new inference. Uh, so uh, GPT uh, was extremely useful uh, because it gave me a, a, a very interesting uh, reply that I didn't have in my mind before. So it gave me something new with respect to my previous knowledge. It generated a sort of inference from my question, from my information that I provided the uh, hit, uh, generating some type of a new inference. So I'm not able to say if it would be able to generate uh, a relativity theory uh, right now, but I can say that it is able to generate new ideas that I have not in my mind when I asked mm. it. Okay. This is an extremely okay. interesting experiment. Okay. okay. We have a question from uh, Abbas Fani. Uh, thank you for your informative presentation. 
What about the author and the output and science, the ethics? If we want GPT to write a poem or a paper, who is the author of the work? I mean, this, this is really a fundamental philosophical yeah. question. <laughs> so, sorry, I, 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 I lost the, uh, the connection for a couple of seconds. Can you repeat okay. the, the question? Uh, it's, the question is, thank you for your informative presentation. What about the author of the output? And the, and the ethics involved with this. That if we want, if GPT writes a poem or a paper, who oh, is okay. the author? Who is the author? Uh, I tried to write poems <laughs> with GPT. <laughs> uh, also, I have some examples somewhere. Uh, it is uh, horrible. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, I uh, don't like uh, uh, GPT for poetic purposes uh, because uh, there is a very special reason for, for that. Uh, poems and art derives from, from uh, emotion, from human emotions. And at the moment we are not able to uh, re uh, replicate in any way the, the depth of human emotions that are at right. the base of any poem, any literature, right. uh, results, uh, composition, and so on. So we can generate something, of course, uh, GPT can generate something like that, but uh, the poetic and artistic value of that is basically zero from my point of view. Right. So um, this is my point of view, of course, I, I don't know if other yeah. people different opinion, but this is my opinion. Uh, Carl uh, Kapler asks a very interesting question. Have you any experience yet asking GPT to read, say, a few dozen papers on a research topic that you mm -hmm. are exploring and make connections between them or clarify an idea? Yeah, yeah, this is uh, a- one, one paper context that compared to another paper. Yeah, this is a very, very good question. Um, because uh, I have tried that, doing that. Uh, I, I uh, tried to um, uh, make a, a list of 30 papers about uh, global optimization uh, in, in, in geophysics. And uh, GPT gave me uh, this list uh, and it said that this, that, that list was included in its knowledge base. And I asked it to extract uh, an abstract, uh, a detailed abstract of each paper. And finally, I asked it to connect all these papers, trying to derive a sort of a unified theory of joint inversion of, uh, and of mm -hmm. optimization. And it worked very well for that absolutely work for them. And if, mm. if you are not satisfied about the, the level of details, you can re-ask the question, GPT, and uh, asking it to in, improve the level of details of its uh, answer. It is extremely useful for that. Yeah, that's, uh, I guess the question then is raised about intellectual property and the intellectual mm. property really resolves to who is asking the question and how yeah. good the question is yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, you can use um, several uh, natural language processing tools for evaluating from a quantitative quantitative point of view the level of novelty of uh, new ideas uh, that uh, GPT derived from combining the, dif uh, the different papers or the different patents. In fact, I created a sort of workflow, uh, including these tools uh, uh, downstream to GPT combination in order to select those uh, combinations that are more creative and more uh, new with respect to the other uh, existing uh, literature. Yeah, just uh, last last question, a, a humorous one from Andre Guzman that he used GPT to write a, a love song for his wife. 
<laughs> okay, I think I don't. There's no more questions, uh, Max. I don't know if you have any anything else. Otherwise, well, it's a it's a topic. I think that it's fantastic. Would be nice fantastic. to 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 talk about for for, for, for a few hours, <laughs> probably you know. But that's more suited for sitting somewhere, yes, in a bar, <laughs> uh, something something like that. But I'm sure this continue will, uh, this discussion yeah, will yeah. continue also about uh, property rights. I mean, that was one of yeah, the things, for right. example, that came up yesterday from like journal editors, right? What are guidelines on somebody using ChatGPT? In which form is it possible? In which form shouldn't it be possible? And so on. And uh, I mean, that will, I think, um, yeah be for the next years to come uh, where we find our position right. on how right. it will work. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. And especially a big thank you to Paolo. And perhaps, thank Paolo, we, we would like to uh, invite you back in um, <laughs> maybe six, eight months to give a, an update on, on how far you've okay. gone with this. <laughs> My thank you, everyone. My thank you. And, uh, thank you very much. Bye, everyone. This thank you. recording. Recording will be online in a, a, f a few hours, and uh, okay. so will the presentation and the video. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye.